In the UK, the problem of nightmare neighbours has never been worse. Oi, you were assaulting me. I was shaking. I was absolutely terrified. One in five of us has been at war with next door. Never forget that, scumbag. <laughs> Where flaring tempers can turn home life into a living hell. We dread coming home. Coming up, neighbours and best friends become sworn enemies. I'm here again. I'm here. There's a way for David to go out. They're always watching. The police are called when a dispute becomes criminal. You're causing me to feel harassed, distressed and alarmed. And it's all-out war in the Cotswolds. And he just went like that, and I just went... In 2002, Steve and Eve Bedford moved to the east of Leeds with their two young children, Jason and Samantha. I grew up over here and we just wanted to be nearly friends and family. Next door lived David and Janet Sheldon, who had been in the area for a number of years. Janet and David introduced themselves, seemed like an okay couple. Um, over the years, we got to know them reasonably well, thought they were all right. We I think we made him a meal, a cup of tea and what have you, because you don't have anything going when he first moved in. Um, they were all right. The two families soon formed a firm friendship, and when the Sheldons renewed their wedding vows, they immediately thought of their next-door neighbours. I was asked to be David's best man. We went up to Gretna Green with about 40 of us, didn't we? Mm. And had a weekend up there, we had a right good time. Everything seemed fine. We thought we were good friends. That's all I can say, and uh, that's all I can say, we were good friends. But three years after the wedding, it all changed. It started with the Bedford's daughter, Sam, who was then 14. My friend was round and my cousin was round, and I'd walked out my drive, and we'd got to here, where Dave, the Sheldon's drive is, and he was doing some work under his car. Um, and all of a sudden, he just come out with, oh, you're still as ugly as ever, aren't you, Sam? And I just laughed it off because I thought, that's just David being David. And then my cousin said, oh, well, I must be just as ugly because I'm a cousin. And then he, from that, he'd said, basically, if I wasn't under this car, I'd kick your head in and get your dad down and I'll do him in as well. I think we were all scared because, obviously, it's a grown man and he's threatening three young girls. Steve Bedford, Samantha's father, was too far away to hear the conversation, but he would soon know about it. David came storming across the road, shouting and bawling, carrying on, absolutely, completely lost the plot, shouting, what are you going to do to, that, to her, that blonde girl? And initially, we didn't know what we were talking about or who we were talking about. But what are you going about, David? And uh, her with the blonde hair, I'm going to cave her. Eddie. I said to him three times, David, what's the problem? What has she said? And I'll have a word. And all he could reply was, I don't know. This conversation was overheard by a neighbour who backs up Steve Bedford's version. But David Sheldon recalls the events differently. The cousin was making comments about, racist comments, to be honest with you, about my family and me. I'm pretty dark myself, like, and I've just come back. Um, from Cyprus again, and I saw quite dark. Anyway, they went off laughing and giggling, and I went over and then talked to Steve about it. Um, I said, look, Steve, have a word with her. It's not nice, that sort of thing. Samantha Bedford denies that any racist comments were made by herself or her cousin. I'm not a violent person, mate. I don't have to be. As it's been said, I am a black belt at uh, martial arts. I don't have to prove anything. I don't have to go around threatening people. It's not my way. The friendship was over, but soon afterwards, when the Sheldons went on holiday, they came back to a nasty surprise. And for some reason, uh, there was a massive great chunk cut out of our edge at the front. So we went round and just asked, you know, what's this all about? And all we got was, we can't see anything wrong. Mm. I don't know what you're talking about. She was laughing her head off with Eve. Yeah. Eve Bedford had a different story. She claims that David Sheldon became violent and threatening. He blew into a rage. He started swearing, 
and blinding at me. Then all of a sudden he came right into my face, lifted both, both his hands to either side of my head, pulsating his fists, and he said, I'm going to cave your skull in. I've never been so scared in my life. Anyway, the next thing, police came. Yeah. Um, Accusing me of assaulting Eve, wasn't it? Yeah. But when the police arrived, there were two versions to the story. And according to the Sheldons, it was Eve Bedford that was throwing the punches at Janet. And we explained what was going on, and, and Janet showed up bruises that she'd got when Eve was physically assaulted her. I had bruises where she grabbed hold of my arm, and when she closed the gate, my elbow got cut. And they asked me if I wanted to take it any further. To be honest, I wish I had a done. I said, what assault was yeah. it? Eve Bedford denies these allegations, but from this moment on, it was all out war for the once best friends. Oh, wait! Yeah, just go home. Just go home. But things were about to get worse. You can't see my backyard, the pieces of trees. It actually attacked our trees. A Cumbrian builder declares war on a former mayor. Basically, I was trying to be a decent neighbour, and I got kicked in the teeth at the end of it. And a budgie breeder gets more than he bargained for. And then he just walked up to me like that. It scared me a bit, because I thought he was going to come for me. Near the market town of Chippenham in the Cotswolds lives Phil Rice in the ground floor flat of a two-storey council block. They're really, really good down here. You know, if we do have issues and we say minor issues, it's forgotten about the next day or in the next few days, you know, and then we just get on like one big family. Phil's an exotic bird enthusiast and shares his flat with a treasured collection of canaries and budgies. That's uh, five baby budgies in there. You know, if I was to sell them private, I could get probably between 10 and 20 pound a bird for them all, depending on their quality. It's a good hobby. He'd lived here for more than three years, when in 2007, a new neighbour moved into the block next door. He come out of there, the entrance there to the free flats here, and he basically introduced himself as saying words along the lines, Hi, I'm Bob, I'm pleased to meet you. And with the first initial meeting, I thought he was quite a decent neighbour. And within weeks of moving in, Keep Vit enthusiast Bob Williamson made an early attempt at bonding with Phil when he was having tea in his flat one day with friends. There was like a knock at the window, like that, and it was, it was Mr Williamson, and uh, he was coming out like saying, oh, you lot ought to come circuit training, you lot ought to weight training and this, that and the other, and salsa dancing. But Phil wasn't impressed with Bob. Salsa dancing isn't for me, not my type of thing. <laughs> At the start off, we thought he was trying to be friendly, but when he kept doing it, we were thinking along the lines, oh, he's annoying. Bob denies this event ever took place, but although he lives in a separate building to Phil, the two blocks share a communal yard. And Phil's habit of bringing his noisy birds out there didn't go down well with Bob. Bob was complaining about the noise level they were making, but, you know, for hell's sake, they're birds. They're going to make noise, you know? It's not like they're cockerels. It's ludicrous. I've never heard any like it, to be quite honest with you. There were growing tensions between the neighbours, but one summer afternoon, this was to go up a level when Phil and his friends were out in the communal yard having a party. I was walking from the shop with ciders and burgers and sausages where we were having a barbecue out the back. We got to roughly around about this point then. Robert was on this driveway and he was fiddling about with stuff in his van. And then he seen me where I am now at this point and he, he shouted, when are you going to turn that noise down? When are you going to stop and all this sort of business? Got his hands in his pocket like that. He said, i got to put my five-year-old son to bed, he said, in a minute. And this is like three or four o'clock in the afternoon. And then with that, he got his hand in his pocket and he, 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 he threw the keys like that. Like that. And then he just walked up to me like that. So he's like make, trying to make himself big. It scared me a bit, because I thought he was going to come for me. I honestly, generally thought he was going to come for me and lay his hands on me or assault me or whatever. According to Phil, Bob's complaint was that the music in the courtyard was too loud. 
The volume, I would say, was at a reasonable level and we turned it down at a reasonable time and stopped playing the music at a reasonable time. Phil called the police. It was left that the police had just basically warned him of his conduct in the street for public order. Bob denies this took place. I walked off to the uh, back garden there, the back communal yard there, and carried on regardless, drinking cider <laughs> and having a few burgers. But this was just the beginning of the Battle of the Neighbours. In Leeds, the Bedford family had fallen out with their former best friends and neighbours, the Sheldons. Both families were now at war after a row between Steve Sheldon and the Bedford's 14-year-old daughter, Sam. And things weren't getting any better. I'd come out of my house and then I'd hear the car engine turn on. And obviously they'd speed up a bit and go past me with a grin and waving and stuff like that. And then I'd come to this bus stop and usually my friend would be here waiting as well. Janet would normally drive past really slowly giving it all the big grins and the smiling and the waving as if to say, like, we're getting away with it and trying to intimidate me and obviously upset me or make me feel angry. But once again, the Sheldons have a different version of the story. Janet had been complaining to me that she was frightened to go to work on a morning because Samantha and a friend were terrorising the front bus stop, yeah. am I right? Shouting abuse at her and gestures and all sorts. David Sheldon says that one morning he followed his wife to work, hoping to catch Samantha Bedford in the act. Went down, I turned right at the end, and I'm coming along, and I saw it for myself. Yeah. They were giving her loads of abuse from the bus stop. But Samantha recalls things differently. He'd slowed right down and opened his car door, and he was shouting, come here, I'm going to kick your head in, um, waving his hands about at me just trying to basically intimidate me. I was terrified, absolutely terrified. The police were called, but no further action was taken by them. But according to the Bedfords, the Sheldons had other ways to antagonise them. They now have some sort of a bird noise tweeting away in the background all the time in the garden. I think you'll find these in them, the front pound shop. Uh, we have about three or four out garden. We like birdsong, and when they start up, they set the other birds going. What's wrong with bird singing? Feeling intimidated, the Bedfords put up CCTV, and one evening it caught something alarming. Once again, it was their daughter Sam who was at the centre of the row. It was a really hot summer's night, and I was like asleep here, and. It got to like early hours in the morning and they'd come back and his wife was stood next to him, shining a torch in my bedroom window. And then they, they were both stood there saying, get out of bed, I just want to kill you all. And he just kept repeating what he was saying. I was terrified because I was only like young at the time. Um, but the Sheldons claim they weren't even home that weekend, and they have the paperwork to prove it. We went on the Saturday, Sunday, and we came back bank we holiday came back Monday. Early on the Monday. When they did get home, this time they were in for a nasty surprise. You couldn't see my back garden for pieces of trees. It actually attacked our trees. The Sheldons claim Mr Bedford had cut their trees and entered their property to do so. He lifted the panel, panel up. up. And there's a uh, stick. Whilst the Bedfords were well within their rights Stop to cut it. back the overhanging You're branches, well it is illegal to enter another person's property without permission. Neither family can prove exactly what happened that weekend, but what is clear is that the neighbours' war continued. Got any next door neighbours now? This man is not a problem, is he? What are you staring at me for? On the 
the outskirts of Carlisle live builder Phil and his wife Vicky Cochran. They moved to this bungalow 10 years ago and have fitted in well with the predominantly retired community. I've done all kinds of things for a lot of people on the street, quite a few. I've done extensions, I've done boilers. You do out for anybody on here, and especially the old people. You know, it's been a move the snow and everything when it's snowing on the morning, five o'clock in the morning off the drive so they can get out. It's too soft, and I'm sick of telling him that. The area, however, did have one recurring problem. The houses are very nice, but the full street has a big issue, um, and it's all to do with water. So when it rains, because the soil is only about 10 inches deep, everything else is clear. So I've done drainage and all that at my own property, as well as doing it at other people's properties in the street. A few years later, Mrs Geddes, a former mayor of Carlisle, and her husband William moved into the bungalow across the road. You know, we were, we were friendly neighbours, and, I, and I, did, I, you know, I speak to everybody on the street. A few years after moving in, Mrs Geddes asked Phil to do some work on her house. And Mrs Geddes pestered the life out of me every time I came home from work to see if I would do the same job at her house because she had the same damp issues. The original quotation that I gave her um, for the £1,700 was from the right-hand side of the house along the front. Then she asked me to do right down into the back garden because that used to flood. Um, so I agreed, it's not a problem. Um, I said, yeah, we, while we're here, we might as well do it. So, so we did. I completed the job, gave her the bill, and that's when it all started. Phil's initial quote for Mrs Geddes of £1,700 had grown because of the extra work she'd asked for to over £3,000. She said she couldn't afford to pay all that money. So I subsequently said, well, give us it here because I'll go and sort it out, I'll doctor it a little bit. Phil knocked 750 pounds off the bill, but Mrs Geddes allegedly said she still couldn't afford it. I said, well, I can't really knock any more money off Jackie because it's actually cost me money now. It was important to get the money because we paid, you know, the materials, uh, we paid the wages for the, for the lads that done the job. So, you know, we needed that money back. A few months later, Phil reissued the invoice. With interest added and discounts removed, it now came to over £4,000. Now she needs to pay up. Um, if, uh, obviously, if she doesn't pay, then obviously I'm considering legal action. But once again, the invoice remained unpaid. It's not good. You take people on trust, you know, and especially your neighbour. If somebody says they're not going to pay, I'm just disheartened by it. Phil decided to make one last attempt to recover his money by sending his business partner, Brian Ridley, to talk to Mrs Geddes and record the conversation for him. Hello. I was waiting for my business partner to, uh, to come back out of the house, uh, Mrs Geddes' house, to see if he's actually got the payment from her. They were in there, I think, about 45 minutes. Being sent to pick a check up. Right, well, you might be doing that, but that didn't solve the problem. And that um, invoice is false. How come? Because it was agreed that the, the cost would be 1,600. He just says, we've got no chance of getting the money, and she says she's not happy. I said, not happy with what? She says, not happy with the job. So I said, well, why is it taking her nearly six months to tell, you, to tell you that she's not happy with the job? She lives right opposite. He's got a track record. Right. Trading right. standards have a track record. Right. right. I passed the file to trading standards. Right. She said that um, she'd reported me to trading standards uh, because it was still damp under her, her bedroom floor. There was nothing wrong with the job. Absolutely nothing wrong with it. If there was a problem with it, why didn't she say at the time when it was getting done? But that wasn't the only surprise for the Cochrans. Mrs Geddes also claimed that she had tried to pay the bill. I tried to pay him three times. Right. Mm. Um, as soon as the work was finished, I went over with the cash. Yeah. But I said I wanted something in writing. I wasn't going to hand over £1,600 in cash yeah. without getting something oh, yeah. for it. Oh, I'm too busy, I. That's a lie. There's no way she's been to my house to pay me three times and we're too busy to take a payment. It never happened. She, she, she didn't come over. She was lying. We just want to get what we're owed. Yeah. We just want to get what we're owed. That's it. 
But the Cochranes were about to get much more than that. You're causing me to feel harassed, distressed and alarmed. Coming up, things get more serious in Leeds. For the next 12 hours, I was locked up in custody. And neighbours come to blows in Chippenham. I just went whack like that, and hard as I could, I headbutted him. In Carlisle, Phil Cochran had fallen out with his neighbour and former mayor, Mrs Geddes, after she had failed to pay his invoice of over £4,000. I've never had any complaints from anybody about any of the jobs I've ever done for them. Everything is done to a high-class standard. The Cochrans were left with no choice but to instruct a solicitor, but rather than a cheque turning up, the police did. Sometime in January, we got a visit from the police, didn't we? Mm. Came to my house um, and said she had a complaint from the neighbour across the road. I so said, your lights are shining in a window when um, you're setting off on a morning. And I've said, so if her house is opposite mine, which it has been for the last eight years that she's lived there, she's never had a complaint before. The police left happy, but a few months later, at 4.30 a.m. Report of lights being shone into a neighbour's window. I was in bed and I heard um, knocking at the window. Um, so I woke up. And I looked out the blinds and I could see the police, like, walking around Phil's van. Lights of a vehicle opposite full beam towards the house. Open the door and, uh, and there's two police officers outside. Your lights shining directly into their property. I've just been up. Check the lights. They were on about me, uh, my headlights shining over to uh, Jackie Geddes' house. I said, well, I'm just, I've just checked my van and, and my van's obviously running. He said uh, he was on about the, the main beam. I said, well, I, uh, you know, it wasn't intentional because I didn't know that the main beam was on. And it's causing these people harassment? If she's making a complaint, that's the harassment bit. She's the one harassing me. Phil claims he tests his high beam every morning, and it was this that Mrs Geddes had reported as harassment. Well, because I've had previous damage in that to my vehicle, I, you know, and it's company practice as well. I mean, you know, you've got to check your vehicle, you've got to make sure it's, it, it's roadworthy on a morning. When the van started, the, 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 the lights come on automatically, so the van lights would have been on, yes, because the vehicle was still running. I never had the lights on deliberately at all. Not long after, the Cochrans received a visit from Mrs Geddes' husband. So I said to Phil, I said, Will Geddes is at the door. So I was like, I says, what's he after? I says, oh, I says, I don't know. So anyways, I went to the door and I answered it. I says, yeah, I says, what are you after? He says, uh, I've come for the uke back. This was a ukulele that he'd given my husband about a year and a half before. It's just a little 10 pound thing, you know, practice thing. So I, I just looked at him. I said, have you got my check? He looked at me, he says, no, I don't think so. I says, what are you after? He says, Phil. I asked him to leave my property five times but while I was asking him to leave he's then verbally assaulting me I says I'm gonna tell you now if you don't leave me property I said I'm quite within my rights to use reasonable force to throw you off my property and uh, and then I shut the door you see Phil reported the incident to the police but their advice was to simply return the ukulele Phil refused he claims he was told that a police officer would call to see him in the next few days. I was just about to put Phil's tea on. The doorbell went and uh, it was the police. I thought they'd actually come about the, uh, the ukulele incident. They said that uh, they've come to arrest me for harassment. I said, it's got nothing at all to do with harassment. I said, it's all because of the money she owes me. I was gobsmacked at this. Phil was arrested for harassment and kept overnight. Cochran, if you go with the officer, you must ask your questions. You don't have to answer them. The next morning, he was charged with harassment and granted bail. A date was set for trial. We're looking at the CCTV footage of us sent to the police by uh, Mrs Geddes, of me coming out to my vehicle. That's me uh, activating the key fob, um, where my lights actually flash. And I'm at the side of the van, so now I'm actually getting in the van. It shows me, um, started my van, Going around doing my vehicle inspections now. Coming around the passenger side, along through, through the past the headlights. 
unfortunately or fortunately, whichever way you want to look at it, Mrs. Geddes actually sleeps in this part of the house where you physically can't see any daylight or van lights shine into our bedroom. She's never once been over. I mean, a normal neighbour would have said, you know, sorry, but your van lights are waking me up in the morning. Could you knock the lights off? Nobody's ever said anything to me about lights. Um, it's only when the police came knocking at my door saying that I'm, I'm harassing this lady um, with my lights. If I purposely position my van to make my lights shine in her bedroom window purposely, explain to me how that gets me paid quicker. How does that get me paid quicker? In Leeds, once best friends and now sworn enemies, the Bedfords and the Sheldons, were at war. Both sides thought they were in the right. Came to the window and could see very clearly that somebody was there putting bricks on top of the uh, dividing uh, pillar. The problem I had was he was building it on my property. So I went out and told him to stop. He built the pillar from here, two bricks wide, all the way up at an angle to avoid the capping stone at the top and took it to about this height. They were all right for a few months and then we got a letter from him stating that if we didn't remove the pillars, he'd do it. And that's exactly what the Bedfords did. A panic Mrs Sheldon called the police whilst filming the Bedfords. And he's just dumping it at the front. That's right. Oh God, I wish I could like a bloody leaf here. It's continuous. You can tell by my voice. Or shaking up. So I'm here again. On me. Sorry. On me own. You seem to delight in terrorising Janet when she's yeah. on her own. The whole family. I'm always here on my own when they start doing things. They wait for David to go out. They're always watching. The police arrived and Samantha and her brother Jason were in for a shock. I was fog marched down the street by the police officers. In the meantime, they also made accusations that my sister did was involved in it. There's nothing that I regret doing because I've not done anything. I got arrested for knocking down a wall that he'd built on our property. And that was it for the next 12 hours. I was locked up in custody. Jason and Samantha Bedford each received a harassment warning for their part in the damage to the brick pillar. The Bedfords and the Sheldons went to court over the boundary dispute. The trial was adjourned for a period of 12 months and all parties were given an undertaking not to harass, assault or threaten. But this was far from the end of the war. I was watering this side of the privet, doing in no way am I squirting it into their garden. Then he briefly shoots out with a cup of freshly boiled water, as far as I'm concerned, and threw it over the privet at me. Clearly stunned me. Oh, no marks on. But when the police went, they want a mark on him. Now I've scalded myself with a cup of tea, and it took three years to get rid of scald. My automatic reaction is to lift my hand up and squirt him. The police say I antagonised him. It's absolutely ridiculous and the CCTV proves it. In Chippenham, the noise of Phil Rice's budgies was the start of problems with his neighbour Bob. And the two had almost come to blows in the street over a noisy party in the communal yard. I've been worried about basically what his next move would do. You just don't know, he's so unpredictable. This communal yard continued to be the main battleground. While Phil's side of the yard contains a discarded sofa, Bob's is well kept, but Phil kept placing his bird table on the border of the two. This, uh, this is a bird table. It was put there for us enjoy to enjoy the sights of some wild birds possibly coming in here. What we get then, the bird table is being moved. It was uh, moved over from that point there where, where, where I'm just lifting it from to there. I put it back there and then it had come sort of like 
more into the corner here, you know, that sort of business. Why doesn't the guy leave Ever's stuff alone? We don't go touching his stuff. We daren't touch his stuff because he'd be the first person to jump up and down on the spot. Despite having no proof, Phil is convinced it was Bob. But it wasn't just the bird table that was causing friction in the yard. He accused me of purposely chucking the pegs on the floor. But what would I want to go do that for? That's just being petty, being real, real petty. In the meantime, he's just gone, put my washing on the floor. It could only be him. It could only be him because nobody else here would have done something like that. This time, he called the Housing Association to complain about Bob. Keen to keep the peace, the association arranged a meeting for the two men in a neutral location. We waited in a, in a room upstairs here in this building for over half an hour or around about, and uh, there's no sight or sound of him. He never turned up, and I think he's wasted everybody's time. He, he said he forgot what time it was, but he knew, he knew. Following the aborted mediation meeting, Phil claims that Bob continued to harass him. When he'd walk by the window, he'd like, <laughs> like that, laughing as though, well, you were fools to go up there, you know? But he was the one who wanted to do it. Why didn't he turn up? And then he'd keep doing that every time he walked past the window. He would just like, <laughs> like that sort of thing. And within months, Bob was back to his old tricks. I was in here cooking one day, as you do, and the phone went, so I picked the phone up. Hello, and uh, he said, you better get outside, because Bob's out there, he was on the phone like this, he said, you better get outside, because Bob's out there uh, sweeping up, and you got all your white washing out there, and there's dust going everywhere, and it, it might have gone on the washing. I come out of that door there, quite a rate of knots, if you like. I walked through the washing like this, and then, I noticed like dirty black marks on there. This actual top was out there then, and it had like black marks there. It's like somebody had gone like that on it, you know? I took them in, and then I had to wash them again. Bob admits to sweeping in the yard, as no one else would do it, but Phil was convinced he had ruined his washing and decided to get his own back. Basically, I put something on my friend's social networking page he lived at the time directly above Bob. I said to my friend, I said, uh, do us a favor. I said, chuck some water bombs and some acid bombs out of your bedroom window on top of Bob's van. And of course, Bob was friends with my friend on Facebook and he, he seen it. And then he's obviously gone and printed it off and, and kept, took it to the police. The police wrapped my knuckles about it, gave me a good, good telling off. You know, you shouldn't go putting stuff like that on social networking sites, you know, they're dangerous things. I hold my hand up and I say, yeah, it's a mistake, you know, it was a wrong thing to do. But Phil's joke would have serious consequences. Bob printed out screenshots of the posting. And he put them from, leading from his, his ground floor all the way up, bang, 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 right up near enough to my friend's front door, I then rung the police. The police had instructed me to take a quick snap on my phone just in case he pulled them all down and said, oh, no, no, I didn't do that, you know, in case he denied it, basically. And I was just about ready with the button, and then he come running out the door like that, and then I'm, like, whipped the phone back into my pocket, and then he's gone up to the wall, whips one off the wall, rips another one off the wall, and he goes, yeah, hey, that's for you, and he just went like that. And then he put his hand on my shoulder. I then said to him, get off me, Bob, get off me. And I just went whack like that, and hard as I could, I headbutted him. And then he got my head into a headlock, went like that, into my face, boom, 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 like that. You know, giving it the left hook or whatever into my face. Following the fight, the police were called and attempted to broker a peace deal between the warring neighbours. Three or four days later, one of the local community support police officers came out. I had to sign a form to stay away from him and he had to sign a form to stay away from me. But it wasn't like an harassment order or anything like that. 
The Housing Association consider the dispute to be ongoing and the police continue to keep watch. It's been several months since the fight and for the moment, peace reigns in Chippenham. From time to time, I do walk out in the garden, you know, to see if he's touched any of my property or fiddled about my washing. He may erupt, you know, he may not. He's like a volcano. But for now, the only noise to be heard in the communal yard is the chirping from Phil's budgies. Coming up, the Bedfords and the Sheldons come to blows. I just managed to squeeze out of the way, otherwise he'd kill me. And the Cochrans fight back. You're causing me to be, feel harassed, distressed and alarmed. In Leeds, the argument between former friends, the Bedfords and the Sheldons, was about to spill out onto the streets. As I turned into Allstart Road, I saw David, as usual, he stuck his fingers up, shaking his fist. I returned the two fingers and pulled into the bank. So I pulled into the car park, and lo and behold, the Stephen sat behind the bank. I heard a screech of brakes, tyres skidding, and David had jumped out of his car at the side of me ran over and was literally punching at the driver's door window, trying to break the glass. And I'm going to have him kill you, then. David Sheldon claimed he approached Steve Bedford to bury the hatchet, but things went horribly wrong. I tried to reverse the car to back off away from him. I don't know if he knew what he was doing, but I was actually pinned, nearly pinned between the two vehicles. I just managed to squeeze out of the way, otherwise he'd kill me. Had me between the two cars and be crushed. And he wasn't wrong. It's gone through my mind since that um, perhaps the best option would have been to put my foot down when he was hanging over the front of the car trying to get away from him and just driven straight into the back of the bank wall. Over the last two years, Steve and his family had been to court four times over the boundary dispute with next door but now he was determined to get David prosecuted for assault. I felt I had no option at this point because the aggression was out of this world. Um, you know, I was seriously concerned and had been for a number of years. But before long, the court case came to an abrupt halt. I had to end my court action because of serious health problems. Well, what he didn't realise is he's got all our costs to pay, about seven and a half thousand. I have no money left. They've taken all my money already. You know, it's, it's cost us probably in excess of 30,000 pounds now. Um, and I just don't know where to turn. The war with their next door neighbours has taken its toll on the rest of the family. It's just traumatised me. It's traumatised us all as a family. And for Samantha, it was a life changer. When I became 16, I got a job so that I could, like, move out. If all this hadn't have happened, I would definitely still be here. But I sort of want to protect my dad. Even now, we, um, you know, we're just gutted and devastated by it, really. I think you should come round here, have a beer, and forget about it all. I mean, I'll write it all off. It's craziness. We're best of mates. Phil and Vicky Cochran had fallen out with their neighbour, the former mayor, Mrs Geddes, after she failed to pay Phil for some building work. Mrs Geddes claimed that Phil was harassing her by shining his van lights in her bedroom window, and he'd been arrested and released on bail. But I'm literally not guilty of any crime because I've never committed a crime or intentionally shone any headlights at a property. But the court didn't agree. He was sentenced to 180 hours community service and ordered to pay £650 court costs and £350 in compensation to Mrs Geddes. And she was wanting 1,150 something pound compensation for her, uh, what was it, reflexology? Yeah, reflexology. Cranial therapy. Um, was it osteopath or something? Oh, yeah, yep. osteopath visits, um, counselling. 
Because she can't remember numbers, she can't remember Dates. words, and she can't put sentences together. But they're all to do with my lights, you see. I have never heard anything as stupid in my life. It was a two-day trial for a set of headlights. That's the top and bottom of it. Three months after the court case, where Phil was found guilty of harassment and served with a restraining order, the police arrived again. Mr. Potter, Ziggy, yeah. Can we come in and have a word with you? No. We need to speak to him, all right? Well, I don't have to open my door. Well, you do, because we're going to arrest him for an offence. What's the offence? Well, we'll tell you when we come in and No, no, it. just tell me what the offence yeah, is. A, a, a breach of your restraining order. Uh, in, what, in, in what respect? In that you've breached it, the wording of it says you're not to shine your lights in the house and you... We've so where have I shown my lights in the house? We've got evidence to suggest you have. No, you haven't. Right. I haven't you shown my lights. So you when did I shine my lights in the house? Well, we'll tell you in an interview, all right? No, no, let me just tell you what it says in that order. It says I must not put my full beam on Sharon over to her house. Yeah, so you'd be better leaving because you're you're causing me to be feel harassed, distressed and alarmed. Doesn't matter what you say, we have to come and arrest you now. Right, are you coming with us, Phil, or not? Yeah, he's yeah, getting I'm his pants. Yeah, well, okay, I'll right. tell you what it is. No, can I, get oh. dressed like? I think that's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. The police decided to take no further action and the Cochranes are still pursuing Mrs Geddes through the small claims court. Mrs Geddes has been asked about the dispute and chose not to respond. He's not a cowboy builder. He knows exactly what he's doing. She just doesn't want to pay. It's as simple as that. We won't be moving from this house. If she can't accept that, then she'd be better moving, wouldn't she? Since filming finished, Mr Cochrane has been arrested again on suspicion of breaching his restraining order. No further action is being taken at this time, but the restraining order still stands and Mrs Geddes is still yet to pay her bill. Next time, feuding neighbours caught on camera. You were saying, I'm going to do you, I'm going to hammer you and you're dead. Life in a Scottish beauty spot turns ugly. They just changed their whole life. For the last few months I've got that I didn't even want to speak to anyone. It's a matter of time until he drops the bucket and comes at me with a hammer. And not everything in this garden is rosy. And all of a sudden he's at me like that. Taking a closer look at the Benefit culture tomorrow night at 8 on Channel 5 with Benefit Brits by the sea. More money worries next too and the team are nervous about a doorstep encounter with a suspected gangster. The new series Can't Pay will take it away.